Well, cheers. Cheers. Welcome. So, first of all, who is Hollis Dunlop and what the hell is he doing in Menorca? Uh, good question. Yeah, I, well, I was born in 1977 in northern Vermont in the United States and been painting from very young age. Um, so it's something I've known I wanted to do for a long time. And after I graduated college, I started teaching more. So the last couple of years I have been doing workshops more overseas like this sort of thing although nothing is quite like this place you know I've been you know getting the hang of teaching groups of people from other countries um, so that's what I'm doing here I was lucky enough to get invited by you guys um, so it's great to be here thank so. you <laughs> sure and you can paint uh, anywhere I mean because uh, <laughs> it seems that you don't have a uh, specific place to paint I don't know if it's improvisation or integration or it's both you know that's a good good interesting it's I can paint anywhere because I started um, you know it's partially because of doing a lot of painting on location like when I started painting I would do a lot of landscape on site so the good thing about doing that is you get used to kind of just random things happening like lights changing or bugs are biting you or it starts to rain or snow you know like cows come and walk through your area so doing that at a young age made it so I can paint in any room you know but that's also been it's not always good for me because sometimes I think okay I need to set things up a little bit more you know really set this a stage sort of thing a lot of times for me I will just you know hire model put them in a pose and start to paint. And then later on I'm like, okay, I need to do this or that. But there is an improvisational aspect to it, you know, because for me, you know, it's kind of grown out of partially being a versatile painter where I can work anywhere. I don't need a perfect, you know, studio setup. Like my, my studio is my living room, my main studio, and it's just full of stuff, you know. But I also... You know, I do feel sometimes that I have to plan it out a little bit more, you know. When you travel, though, you never know what you're going to get. You know, you can literally get an amazing studio or you can get a little tiny room somewhere with no windows. You know, you never know. So you have to be... I think if you're going to teach people and you're going to travel, you it's good to be versatile like that, to be able to work with whatever you have, you know. In this case, there's all kinds of things here, though. So everywhere I'm looking, I see something I would do, but... You know, like I was saying, I, I can think of ten paintings I would do, but if I get three done, <laughs> you know, yeah. that's good, you know, in a week. So, yeah. Because actually you're quite like the method guy, I mean, yeah. aren't you? I mean, you're very methodical when you're working. Oh, and yeah, and... very much. Yeah, I'm very... I like to be organized, you know. it's For me, it's it's partially... I like to have as few things to think about as possible when I'm working because it requires so much concentration just if you have a model and like there's a lot of parts of painting that I'm trying to integrate at once like drawing, anatomy, lighting, color, paint, textures, all of that is so complex that that's why I have a fairly simple setup and it's very very methodical exactly you know I like to have the everything organized if anything gets a little off it's like I, I it's a little strange you know so um yeah people were asking me about that y yesterday you know I, I do like to make it as simple as i can you know simple materials no no nothing that i don't need like mediums or paints that i don't need um stuff like that you know so definitely methodical yeah but you can work with any kind of material with crappy <laughs> material or you are Yes. This kind of a uh, darkness specific. I can work with anything. Um, I like to have, uh, you know, I was joking because a friend of mine, a, f a couple of people that I know have like their paintbrush sets. They're very nice. And I was thinking I should get mine like the ghetto, like Walmart brush set for people. You know, that'll be my thing. You know, it's very kind of funny because there's all these fancy like brush makers now. And then I'm going to like, I go through brushes so quickly that I end up going to the local like craft store and just buying whatever they have because I can't wait a week to get them in the mail. So I end up just, I need something today, you know, to work with. So I can, 
I, I try to use materials that are archival. You know, I don't want anything to fall apart, you know, because if people are buying work, you don't want to deal with that. But I certainly don't think you need the best things either. I think that that's a little bit... That's another one of those things that I don't want to think about. You know, it's like, don't worry about... I don't need the best, you know, $200 a yard linen. You know what I mean? I can just buy something that's kind of good enough. You know, like, I, I like the panels that I'm using are fairly cheap, but I really like them. You know, they just work for me. Um, so you don't need... You don't need anything really fancy. You know, that's the funny thing. Um, not if you're interested in actually working. You know, when it's about the work, you know, you don't need... Uh, to spend it's expensive enough frankly to buy materials you know what i mean i spend a lot of money like you know that with that stuff so simple is good so. and about talking about the method of being methodical uh where does the method get how far does the method get to i mean and when do the personal decisions start to appear you mean maybe like versus like concept versus yeah, just like the, in the process and um that's a good question you know for me I've been very, I went way down the road of just technique for so long because I became kind of obsessed with painting technique and how is the painting actually done almost to the point where the concept weren't really there anymore. And now I'm trying to get back a little bit more of, to make the painting a little more interesting. So it's not just, here's a figure painting and I can render the arm really well. You know, I do want a little bit more than that. You know, that's why when I'm painting in the studio, I like to put the room in the background. So there's a little bit of a story there. Even if it's a very simple thing, something is happening. It's not like isolated figure, you know, with no space. Um, does that what you mean? More like conceptual yeah. versus technique? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's funny because conceptual, if you have a really good idea, that can carry your painting. Like if your painting technique is a little bit... Like, there's a painter named Eric Fischel. Do you know Eric Fischel? And he's someone who I think of... His paintings are very interesting. I don't love his technique, but I find his paintings interesting. Even someone like Edward Hopper, his paintings to me are very beautiful, but they're almost awkwardly painted. Um, sometimes you can see him kind of struggling to get the drawing right. You know, I can imagine him kind of painting there, like, God damn, I gotta get this line. You know, there's a feeling of where he's really trying his hardest to get that out there. But there's something else in his work that makes it beautiful to look at. I don't know quite what it is. It's maybe, you know, I think about his painting. It, like, there's a vulnerability there, which is almost aside from conceptual thing, because there's a conceptual artist where you don't need any kind of representation even in the painting. You can just title it and that's enough. If your title is really good, you don't even need the visual anymore, you know. And, and um, so there's many ways, I guess, I guess my kind of weird way of coming to that point is that there's many ways to do it. Like if you're painting at a technique of like a Fairfield Porter, Edward Hopper, um, some of the awkwardness of the painting, the, the sensitivity there almost makes it more interesting to look at, you know. Um, you can see a little bit of the person behind the painting, um, which is sort of a more, I guess that's a more <laughs> sort of modern thing, you know, but you don't even have to be a representational painter anymore. You, If you have a good title, you can write, you can write your painting, you know, which I really haven't done much of. I have a terrible time titling my paintings. In fact, I hate doing it. Unless I think of a title ahead of time, which is like one out of every 10 paintings. But I've got about 30 paintings now that I'm still working on the titles, you know, and I have these kind of abstract ideas of what they are, but putting them into words is very challenging. So I'm in the middle of that because, you know, I, I have to have that ready for the next show. So I want, I don't want to just title it, you know, female nude number 10, which is maybe what I should do. You know, maybe that that's better than trying to give it a phony title, you know. If it's a simple painting, it's okay for a simple title, you know, but I do, I find, you know, a title can really draw people in. Or if you have an idea and you're going to draw people to that idea. So I, for me, it's been a real challenge because I, I went to a school that was very traditional and I was obsessed with just technique, you know. I mean, just that's all I thought about, <laughs> you know, it's all I cared about. didn't care about anything else. You know, so. Um, and is it possible to have a good 
odd connotations without studying the classics. Do you think so? Oh, you say that again. I'm... That if you, you think it's possible to have a good art basics oh, without, without studying the classics. Studying. Absolutely. I think, though, that well, the funny thing is that so much of the classical paintings are these kind of religious paintings. And that's, I think it's a good thing. That's slowly going away. People don't think the earth is flat anymore. They don't think that Mary was a virgin necessarily. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's all these stories that I think they're stories, but you know, whatever. Um, all of these paintings that I love are essentially religious propaganda, you know, where the poor people are going to come into the church and be overwhelmed by this, th this visual vision that they see. Um, so if you study that, it's interesting because how am I going to take that and modernize it, you know, and, and kind of create a new version? So for me, it was just like, why even bother doing that? And painting just one figure is challenging enough anyway, so I'm not going to put five figures together. Velasquez, you know, doing the five incredible paintings with five, you know, that's very difficult. And it's not many painters do that. For me, I have enough trouble doing two figures even in a painting. is extremely challenging. Um, I think if you like classical work, you should study it, you know, and study as much as you can. But if it's not what you're interested in, um, I wouldn't force someone to study it, you know. I would say if you want to do conceptual work, go right to that. You know, don't worry about it, you know. I mean, I think um, you probably know this. It's a lot of traditional schools now, the big selling point is learn the techniques before you experiment. You have to learn the basics before you do this. And I don't think that's true, you know, because I think, I think that's what they use to draw students in. But I don't think that um, learning the classics is, is going to make, for example, Damien Hirst more interesting. I think if you're a human being, you're going to feel the, you know, the ideas about life, just like anyone else, whether you study classics or not, you're still going to be able to do work, whether you can draw a figure or not, you know, I don't think like David Hockney drawing with his pencil figure drawings necessarily made him a better artist, <laughs> you know, it didn't seem to be, I'm like, you know, if you love classical drawing, do it, you know, but if you don't, I wouldn't uh, do it, you know, I would say if you have strong ideas, you know, paint in a symbolic way, and then the paintings are going to be interesting, you know, if your ideas are good. You know, if your ideas are bad, they're going to be bad whether you're a classical painter or not. I, don't, I know many classical painters who I don't find interesting. You know, they just kind of these very, the same old ideas they're just kind of presenting, and there's no real, there's no connection through time to classical art versus modern art. They think they're two different things. And I just don't think they're two different things. I think there's a lot of intersecting, you know, but a lot of the, the uh, I was lucky because I had a lot of different teachers. You know, I didn't only have one classical master who said, draw this way, and that's it. This is the way to do it. Um, so I was lucky. Some students aren't so lucky. They have kind of a dom dominating teacher who is like the last surviving person in the world that paints this way. So then the students feel that they have to do that to carry on the tradition. And I don't feel that way as much, I guess. <laughs> you, you talk about, uh, a lot about dingy color. I think it was your, your teacher. What, what was the best? Oh, Dean, yeah. yeah. What was the most interesting thing you learned from him? Oh, many things. Uh, there's so many levels to, to the way I work. You know, I was lucky to have him when I did it, you know, because for me, he was the type of teacher that made you want to do better you know if, like when I went into his class I felt like that's where I need, was supposed to be for the first time in my life you know because when I was in high school it was a kind of if you were in athletics you would do well or if you could really if you're really academic you'd, you would do well if you're really athletic you, and I was neither of those th things you know I wanted to you know draw and play guitar you know so it was kind of I didn't really fit in there but I knew I wanted to paint, so when I went into his class in college, I was like, okay, this is where I'm supposed to be. He was very empathetic. He was very quiet, but he could draw so well that everything he would say was very... You know, he didn't even need a model. He would just stand up in front of everyone and draw the figure out of his head and kind of construct a figure, you know, based on... an You know, he would anatomically set up a pose, sort of like a stick figure, 
and build the figure from that really beautifully. And there's not many people that do that now. It's very dependent on the model, which in many ways I've become. You know, I used to draw more out of my head, but um, Dean would just draw. And he loved history, so there's that connection to to art history there as well, which I liked a lot. And at the time, we liked the same artists. You know, we both were kind of idolized Michelangelo, Caravaggio, you know, the Italian artists, a Spanish artist too, Velasquez, Ribera, you know, the good painters. <laughs> um, so Dean was a special guy. You know, he very incredible draftsman, very quiet, but extremely knowledgeable, can tell you anything, ask him any little bone or muscle in the in your arm, he'll tell you why it's named that, like what it does, like the history of everything, he could explain all of that. So, um, and how do you balance that, the, the balance between what you see and what you know? Uh, good question. Um, you, for me, what helped me do that was studying, this is where the studying classical art helps enormously with that, because they've figured that out already for you. You know, the like Greek sculpture, um, they've already figured out kind of the best, like if you're just going to draw a deltoid, you can draw it, but there's a way to make it look better if you know what to look for. So there's little rhythms you look for. So for me, um, when I'm looking at the model, I try to... 50%, maybe more than 50% probably, you know, it is, you know, you're staring at the model, but I'm interpreting like the arm or the leg, you know, through looking at a lot of Michelangelo sculpture, a lot of um, classical art, so you know how, where the best looking forms are. It doesn't always work for me, but generally um, I have an idea of what to do because of that, uh, because they have not just studied anatomy, they have studied, uh, you know, before people really studied anatomy, they just used their eye. And over centuries, you know, they figured out this is how something should look for it to look its best. You know, so that for me is what helped a lot is just doing a lot of copies, master copies, you know, when I was 13, 14, you know, it was enormously helpful. Because just anatomy alone is not going to teach you anything. You know, I had have had surgeons in my class you know, many that knew every muscle you can ever name and know every function, you know, but they can't draw any of it, you know, so you have to balance the, probably, like you say, 50% what you know, 50% what you see. Um, it's easy to get caught up in copying the model. Whenever that happens to me, it's very stressful. You know, I need, I need to be able to visualize the whole pose, you know, instead of just looking at one area, I need to feel the entire form, you know, kind of in my head, have a feeling for, okay, there's the rib cage, you know, there's the hips, like, and what what angles does that, that need to have to look the best, especially because the pose will change a little bit. So one angle will be here, one pose, then it'll be here. So you got to select, you know, so hopefully uh, that's something you can get better at if you study the right things. You name Michelangelo several times. Yeah. What is it that inspires that much from Michelangelo, besides his mastery, of course? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, his personality was very... He's a very emotional guy. So I think when you're a teenager, you're also very emotional. So it's easy to... For me, I related to his work, that kind of longing in his work for something. Um, he's extremely intense and you can see just this sheer amount of inspiration that he had is really amazing so for me that that was inspiring you know i don't work nearly that hard you know i'm probably very lazy can and he did so much work in his life but i can still appreciate the the work ethic um so he just seemed to me like aside from the his you know incredible talent is i was interested in him as a person i think he was kind of an introverted person so he wasn't like known as like, for example, he was kind of sh shy, you know, and he wasn't like a very handsome man. He was always self-conscious about that his whole life. You know, he's doing these beautiful figures and he always would, had this wish that he was like that almost, but he wasn't. You know, he was a shy kind of contemplative person. And I think for me, I related to that because that's how I, I was, you know, especially when I was younger. 
um, <clears throat> you know, someone who was just really into their art. Um, and also just his also love of history. You know, he didn't just, he wasn't born able to sculpt, you know, he studied masters as well. You know, he was doing copies of other artists, you know, which, which helped me learn. I was like, okay, this is how this guy did it. You know, he didn't just come out of nowhere, you know. Uh, he learned, even though he learned at a very young age. You know, So for me, it was kind of like a blueprint almost of how to learn how to draw. You know, if you look at their life, you know. I was also, you know, I studied him. All the big Renaissance artists, Leonardo, Raphael, I was obsessed with them for a number of years. You know, every little historical thing, you know. So. And what did you not learn in the school in college or oh, in college or what did i not learn nothing i didn't do almost any conceptual art there you know so i realized like when i got out of school it's kind of like when you go to a traditional school you're in that little bubble there which is good because you focus on one thing but the art world now is so big there's so much stuff so you really have to um it can be overwhelming, you know, and especially like I was showing in New York for a number of years. And if once you start doing that, it's easy to get sucked into the money, the kind of more bigger, more expensive, whatever. It's easy to get sucked in there and to forget why you started doing it in the first place, you know. So I had to learn the business part of it, you know, which I was very irresponsible with when I first was out of school. Um, so I had to learn that and just, um, um, I like all types of art, you know, I, I love conceptual art, you know, so I want to do both, even though I haven't really, I'm still way up 90% technique, you know, a little bit of concept, but I'm slowly doing this. Eventually I want to kind of have a mix, you know. Um, Actually, your paintings are becoming a little more narrative, they have more... Story. A little bit, yeah, I'm trying to, you know, I mean, especially, I mean... I used to only, I used to have none of that, you know, so I'm trying to be a little more interesting. I'm at least trying to make it look like something might be going on there, where it's not just, here's a model on a model stand, you know, like when I was painting yesterday, that's why I, I like to put things in the room in the painting, so you can see something maybe is going on there, you know, because even once you add another figure into the painting, besides just the one, it takes on a little bit of a storyline. And I like that, you know, it's it's not difficult to do. It's 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 really the simplest way to get more concept in there. Just add another person somewhere. You know, there's many artists I don't know of. You know, I'll be out somewhere and they'll, oh, you know this artist? I'll, I'll think to myself, uh, <laughs> no, I've never heard of this artist, you know, but maybe they're more modern artists, you know. Like, it's an entirely different world of, like, conceptual work, you know, versus the kind of realist figure work. I try to follow both of them so I kind of know, at least know what's going on a little bit. And about figurative art we were talking, mm -hmm. how do you see it in the future, in the next 10, 20 years? Is it going yeah. upwards? Or? Well, that's a good question. Um, it's never to me like a direct answer because I think that it depends on what artists do with it. You know, I think that I like, um, it. I guess, in the simplest sense, it seems like it's becoming more fashionable again to paint the figure, realist painting. Um, but I also see it changing so much in the sense that there's there seems to be more figurative art now, but the way they're painting it is more modern. Like, in other words, they're using Photoshop a lot, things like that, which you didn't see maybe even, you know, even in the 1980s, you didn't have anything like that. So the internet and computers have changed enormously how people are working. So in a one sense, people say, oh, this is great, there's the resurgence of figurative art. But the fact is a lot of gallery owners or clients, they don't really understand the way the work is made. They only know if it's a figure or not. You know, where I can always tell when I go into a gallery if a person really knows how to paint or if they're just projecting a photo and tracing it, you know, I can I can tell those things, but a lot of people can't, so they just think it's all the same, you know. Which and for me, I'm conflicted about it. You know, I don't mind working from photographs. You know, it's fun actually, but I always feel much better if I'm working from life or even out of my head, which I almost never do anymore. 
but it feels much more like I'm really painting. If I have a model, that just makes me feel better, you know, like I'm living then, um, instead of looking at a computer screen. It almost, it's, it's, to me, it's almost two different things. So I think that there's many different branches of figurative art, and they seem to be going kind of different directions. Um, I'm, I'm very conflicted about it, you know, because there's a part of me that finds more modern kind of techniques interesting because you can do things maybe much more easily, um, you know, that you can't do if you just get a model. There's poses that models are going to have trouble holding, you know, so <clears throat> I think um, it could go anywhere, you know. I, I see a little bit of of both things, you know. It, you know, figurative art may become more popular, but that doesn't mean that real painting will be more popular, you know. People may not really understand um, how to paint from life, for example. And even in 10 years from now, they're going to forget a little bit more, you know, with the exception of a few small schools, you know, keeping that alive. You know, the one thing I noticed, though, is that a lot of those schools are almost so traditional that they almost disregard the past hundred years of painting, and there's a lot of really interesting painters so it's almost a little bit too, like they have this narrow view of what's beautiful, you know, and, and I, I find like, I like John Curran, I like Lucian Freud, you know, I like those painters, and I think they have a lot of interesting things, so I think it's, it's almost, you know, you don't want to cut off, you know, different styles and say, this is beautiful art, this is kind of ugly figure painting, like, you know, um, like, I would rather look at a Lucian Freud than a lot of, you know, contemporary figure painters that I know that do kind of um, paintings that are too pretty, not gritty enough, if you know what I mean. Like, uh, here's a painting of a pretty girl. Like, yes, I agree. She's a pretty girl. That's nice, you know. But on the other hand, it's not very interesting to me. You know, I would rather paint someone old or someone who is, you know... Whatever, you know, whatever's something wrong with them, I don't know. Or or someone who's good-looking, it doesn't matter is the point. So I think if you're really going to modernize figurative art, you want to look at the past hundred years of painting as well, you know, and there's good things there that you can take from it. Um, you know, it's not just about this is what so-and-so does and this is his technique and we're going to do this technique because it's the way to go. You know, you can you can choose five different techniques. Any of them can be good, you know, whether it's direct painting or underpainting, whatever it is. So hopefully it becomes more popular because <laughs> I like more figures, you know. Um, but I'm also not one of those people that's worried about figurative art dying, you know, or, oh, the galleries are only showing modern crap, you know. I like a lot of that stuff. It's A lot of it is garbage, you know, but once in a while you see something very interesting, you know, that I, it's, you know, it's certainly a, it's a strange thing, you know. Like, there's certainly galleries that are against skill-based painting. Um, but, you know, you should have something else besides just the skill. If it was only about skill, you know, I could take any random page from one of these books and copy that page in excruciating detail in a painting, and that would be the best painting ever if it was all about skill. But I don't know that that would be a very fun painting to look at, you know what I mean? Like, I like, I like a painter like Van Gogh, who is maybe, is he skillful? He's a skillful painter, but not really skillful. He's not skillful, like, if you compare Van Gogh to, you know, John Sargent, you know, Probably not as skillful, but I think Van Gogh is much more interesting. So, Sargent, you know, I, I, there's not a single thing I find interesting in his painting aside from his technique. Van Gogh, I could look at his painting all day. And then, in your particular case, Hollis, do you always paint things that you're interested in, or you ever felt under pressure of galleries and clients of painting all the things? Um, now, only things I'm interested in. Um, I have been in galleries where they didn't tell me what to do, but there are things that they know will sell more easily. So they will, they'll encourage you. Or you can tell when you bring your paintings there, the ones they get really excited about. You know, because they always have their, their kind of specialties of, for what they sell. So you can easily get sucked into that. Especially when you're 
getting a check for, you know, 15 or $20,000, you know, it's like, okay, I could do this more, you know, so I try not to do that. I, I think, though, that the fact is, if you can paint, if your technique is good, you can, and you have good taste, you can get away with painting almost anything, you know, like maybe not portraits of people's dogs, you know, I don't want to critique people too badly. But, you know, that's a very hard subject to paint, for example, without being sentimental and, like, doing a bad painting, you know. But then again, look at Velasquez did some beautiful paintings of dogs, incredibly painted, you know. But so it depends on who the painter is. So the better you can paint, the more you can get away with it. But I think it's always better to really try to avoid painting when you know half the time when I've done that too, then the painting I think will sell doesn't sell. So you never know what people will buy. I think I I've told this story a dozen times, but the last show that I had in New York, the first four paintings that I sold, two of them were my least favorite paintings in the show, and the other two weren't even going to be in the show. That I just needed some paintings at the last minute. One of them had been in my closet for like six years behind some stuff. Hated this painting. Didn't didn't hate the painting. Let's just say I wasn't planning on showing the painting. Put it in the show as the first one that sold. Some lady liked something about it and bought it. So I think, oh, that's really strange. You know, I didn't even really like this painting. Um, so you never know what people will like. Um, but I did do, like when I was in New York in that gallery, I had, I had done, like I did a big painting of a scene in Central Park, which it was a good painting, but it could easily have been a cheesy painting too. But I made sure that it wasn't a postcard look, you know what I mean? It was kind of this really dark and brooding, kind of moody scene, you know? It almost looked like you were going to, like, ghosts, like, flying around. So it wasn't your typical painting, you know? So there's ways, in other words, to... You can paint something that will have a chance of selling and still make it a good painting. Because even, I mean, let's face it, I mean, the best works of art, those artists got paid for all those paintings. You know, Velasquez didn't just do his paintings because he liked it. He's doing portraits, he's getting paid for these paintings. Michelangelo got paid a lot of money for the Sistine Chapel ceiling, you know? I don't think he would have done it if he wasn't getting paid a lot of money. You know, so that's still, there's a commercial aspect to everything. I think it's silly to say, oh, look at this artist that, like, like Van Gogh desperately wanted to sell his paintings. He just couldn't, but he desperately wanted to. It's all he thought about. You know, like Edward Manet, always worrying about selling his work and being accepted and people liking his work. He's obsessed with it, you know, to the point where, you know, people didn't like his painting. He was really depressed about it. You know, he wanted people to like what he was doing. So I think that it's not a bad thing to paint paintings that are saleable if you are smart enough to make them a good painting. You know, you just, you can't be like a... You know, you know, and you, maybe you know our former president of the United States, Bush, is a painter now, and he does these very bad paintings. But the funny thing is, is they're kind of interesting, and I'm almost feeling bad that I like them because I think, wow, okay. here's the only thing I've ever liked that this guy did. Everything else in his life was a disaster, you know. But now he's doing like these ridiculous self-portraits, and I'm thinking, well, here's a man with no technique at all, you know, just trying to paint, and he's probably got some teacher somewhere that's bad that says, yeah, do a portrait of your dog, it'll be great, you know, and so he does that, um, but, it, I don't know, but it's a pure painting, he's not trying to sell anything, so good for him, <laughs> so I can't believe we're talking, brought, bringing, bringing how, how does all this art business make you feel, like, frightened, or un Depressed. uninterested? Yeah, no, it's both, some days I'm excited about it, other days I'm like, oh my god, I open up, like, Facebook, and it's like, I'm deluge of, like, 50 different paintings, and 20 different galleries like so you can very much feel bad after it it's like if you're ever in the states and you go into new york city it's a great city but it's also so overwhelming you feel like you know you have to buy certain clothes you feel like you're not good looking enough you feel like you have to fit in you know it's like all this pressures of advertisements everywhere and that that kind of commercial thing so if you look at a lot of galleries it's for me anyway i can feel a little bit overwhelmed so I'm like I think okay let's just do a painting and not worry about it you know I mean I I it's a good thing and a bad thing it's good when I see a painter that I really like and a painting that's really impressive that's inspiring other times you see some random painting going you know selling for a million dollars 
and it's so random. Like, there's no reason for it to go for that much money other than it's in a big gallery, and they can price it that high because it's a big gallery. But, I mean, I know so many painters that are really good that aren't even in galleries, you know. There's a certain randomness to it. Just like if a band gets a record label that will promote them. Like, is Nirvana the best band in the past 40 years? Probably not, you know, but they got good promotion at the right time, you know, something like that. I, I, I'm i dating myself by bringing up a 90s band. I don't even know what's popular anymore, <laughs> you know, who's popular now. Um, I don't know, Beyonce is popular, right? So that's what you don't like, I like about her. the art business. Well, I like Beyonce, but I don't like the <laughs> art business. <laughs> I like her a lot more than the art business. Now, um, yeah, the art business is just so random. It's very it's the only business I can think of where you can do a complete piece of garbage and sell it for a million dollars, you know. You can do something great too, you know, maybe the idea is really good, but you can't just you can't build a car any way that you want and sell it. There's like every other career, you know, you have to kind of you have guidelines if you're going to be a surgeon or you're going to, you know, do be an accountant or you're going to do whatever you want to be a surfer you know you there's gonna be things you learn but in art you can do anything now which is it's what's great about it it's what's terrible about it you know if you ever have kids and they want to go to art school just get ready you know fifty thousand dollars a year and they may just splatter some paint around and get nothing out of it except a lot of debt you know and they have nothing out of it and they're taking so much they're, so much money now you know is involved in it like I said, I know so many good painters whose paintings sell for very little. And then, like, you'll see a show where, you know, five paintings are all $500,000 and they all sell. You know, and they're not even really that good. It's just that the person maybe knows the right people. So there's a, that aspect of it can be depressing. But if you worry about it, there's no reason to worry about it because you're not going to feel good. Like, what, what makes you forget those things you don't like? Well... Luckily, I can still sell paintings, and even if I make, you know, if I sell a painting for $10,000, that feels pretty good. You know, even though I'm not making a million dollars, it's still good money for someone like me. So I'm happy that I can even do that. And what makes me feel good is that I can paint. I know what I like. So I feel, um, if I was too caught up in the money part of it, I think that I would almost be probably a little bit depressed. You know, it can be depressing to kind of go that way. You know, we're all in the same boat, you know, no matter how much money you have, we're all getting older, you know, we're all kind of stuck here for a short time. Even if you're multi-billionaire, you know, he probably is not going to live longer than me. That doesn't mean he'll have more fun than you or me, you know what I mean? There's The great thing is that if you can travel a little bit, the best things about living, I think, are still accessible, you know, not to the poorest people, unfortunately, because there's a lot of people that aren't lucky enough to be able to go around a little bit. But if you can figure out a way to make a little bit of money, you can still do a lot of enjoyable things, you know. Um, so it's kind of like a love and hate relationship with money. Yeah, well, look at Donald Trump. Miserable bastard, <laughs> lots of money, but absolutely unhappy person, you know. So there we go won't talk about too much politics but i'll <laughs> so there you go yeah well, cheers, cheers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah money won't make you happy it can definitely make it can make you temporarily happy maybe though you know i'm not going to say that money won't make you entirely happy because you know for even people in my family money has had a huge influence you know um for you know good and bad things happening you know so it can really affect people. And I remember times when I didn't have any money, how stressful it was uh, daily. You know, just how am I going to pay for my car repair? How am I going to pay my rent next month? You know, it's very stressful. You know, it, it, it's, it's a strange thing, you know. So you have to figure out a way to get by if you want to be an artist and you want to make your money that way. Um, there's a lot of galleries that will work with you, though, that want to make money as well, you know, so, you know, there's ways to do it. Um, I think it's because it's hard to make a living out of painting. I mean, was it hard to decide for you, or it just came itself? No, it wasn't hard to decide because I did know, though, that if I was going to have a shot at making money, I needed to get to be a good painter while I was young. I, I, that, I felt that would help me, 
you know, so I practiced a lot when I was in high school, for example, because I didn't want to say, okay, dad, you know, I'm going to art school now and he's going to pay for my schooling. So I felt like I wanted to take advantage of that and not waste his money, you know. And I, I went to a fairly cheap school, you know, but still it's expensive, you know. So I felt like with all the random art now, I wanted to make sure I had something that was, you know, I could back up my choice to do that. Um, and for me, you know, we grew up fairly poor, so I didn't need to make a lot of money, you know. I don't need to make, you know, I mean, I can live well. If I make forty to $50,000 in a year, I can live well making that, you know. It's nice if I make more, you know, but I usually don't. You know, I mean, a couple years I made more than that, and I was amazed, you know, like, like uh, how much difference, you know, just a little bit of money can make for your lifestyle, you know. So, like, if you're making, you know, right around, you know, forty to fifty thousand dollars off your paintings, you're still barely able to afford things like insurance, you know, like a nice car. That stuff you're right on the edge. But if you're making eighty thousand, then you can afford those things. So there is that, right around that. I don't know what it's like here, but in America, it's it's very much like that. Um, yeah, it's very like yeah. I mean, that can make may, maybe a bit of added pressure. Yeah. Like, but do you usually get blocked? I mean, like, uh, you don't know what to do when you're facing a creativity well, about creativity and about yeah. the pressure that all money the, can put on it. Yeah, all the time. I mean, I think about it a lot. I mean, I don't. What happens to me? I will get. I'll feel good for a couple of weeks. I'll do a bunch of paintings. And then for two weeks, I will get nothing done. I'll get really depressed about it, you know? And I'm like, ah. Like, you know, the last week, you know, it was kind of like that. I was struggling with this one painting. And for me, that's kind of part of it. And I'm always telling students, don't worry, keep going. And then I have to remind myself of what I say to students. Like, don't be a hypocrite. Don't give up on your painting if you don't like it. Keep going. So that's what's happening to me now is... I know this painting isn't probably, it may sell, probably not, you know, but I'm just doing a painting and, and a lot of it starts there for me. I just think, okay, I'm going to do a painting, you know, if I'm having a mental block, whatever comes to mind, I'm going to do it and just start there. And then maybe that will lead to something else. Um, Is but I something do. something that helps you out to, to, to get over it? Yeah, well, usually I will just... I think it's all like your own body chemistry. Certain days you're going to be happier for no reason. One day you're just going to feel really good. The next day you might feel terrible and kind of angry about something. For me anyway, it's like that. I'll get happy at random times and be really sad at random times. This is almost like certainly like your diet or if you're drinking or eating bad food, that can help or, or not. You know, if you're not sleeping, you can more easily become emotional. But I think... Um, <clears throat> For me, it's a little bit random, you know, I will feel good at random times, so I'll start a painting then. Sometimes I will just hire a model, like I have a model that I've hired for when I'm getting back home already now for like two days. So whether I'm ready to paint or not, I'm going to paint that day. Um, like she's a beautiful model, so I have a chance to do something nice. Even if I don't feel good, I'm going to paint anyway, you know, and maybe halfway through the painting I'll start to feel better, you know. So sometimes that's all it is, is just whether I feel good or not, I've got to do some paintings, you know, and remember that I'm still lucky to be able to do it, you know, so <laughs> it's a lot of people that don't get to do something they like, you know. It's like visiting museums, like when you visit a museum, you get, you feel like vertigo or you feel like peas, well, what does it make you feel? Uh, I felt, well, I was in New York two weeks ago, and I went to the Met and then went to the Whitney, and I really loved going to both. It was inspiring. Because the Met, we went to kind of a very traditional, kind of Baroque show, incredible paintings. So we saw that, then we went to the Whitney, which is very modern, you know, Edward Hopper paintings. And there's a painting by Larry Rivers that I loved, of like two old women. It was the same woman, painted twice, but oh, really amazing beautiful painting just one she's standing here and another she's sitting in a chair and that kind of inspired me a little exciting painting to me just the way he was painting um, so I felt good seeing them but I don't need to go to museums as much I don't enjoy it all the time because sometimes I'm like I've seen these paintings so many times um, 
I think lately I've been enjoying more modern stuff. I was talking so. also about the sensation that sometimes many artists have about knowing nothing about painting. I mean, it's this kind of moments mm -hmm. when you think you know nothing about painting. Does it happen to you? Yes. Yeah, it does. Uh, it does almost every painting I do. You know, at some <laughs> point, not always, maybe I would say like one out of every, you know, six paintings goes like really just everything clicks. Other ones are a little bit more of a struggle. You know, something I'll hit like a road, a roadblock and I'll go backwards for an hour. And then I'll realize I was going the wrong way and I'll have to fix everything that I did the past hour. Like even like yesterday, I was telling a story to someone. I, so I'm painting the model and, you know, it's not my class, so it's kind of nice to just not say anything. So I'm sitting there painting. Mm -hmm. And it, so I finally think, okay, I'm going to work on her head now because I decided, oh, she's beautiful. I want to get a portrait in there. So right when I started doing it, then someone in the class went up to the model and said, oh, could you turn your head to the side? So I was like, oh, I guess I'm not working on the head. <laughs> After all, I think it'll just be right where it is. So I kind of made the choice, okay, I'm not going to worry about it, you know. And at another point, you know, just specifically for that painting yesterday even, there was a time when I was just deciding, all right, the head is a certain size and the torso is a certain size and I want to make sure the proportion looks right. So that can go both ways. Sometimes I'll make the wrong choice and make the wrong part bigger or smaller and then I don't know until after I did it. So then you can easily lose an hour of time with the model by going the wrong way. So that happens fairly regularly for me. You know, I will start to draw the head a little more detail and then the head will get a little smaller and I have to repaint the entire body, you know. So that can be very stressful, very difficult, when, especially when you're paying a model, you know, to, to pose and you're losing time because you can't, <laughs> can't get something basic right. Um, it's part of the process, though. For me, it's just... It's so what makes it a real painting. Which yeah. part of the process you like the most? I mean, you, you prefer starting a painting or ending it, finishing it? Well, if you can finish one, it's a great feeling. You know, starting it is fun too, but I think I prefer ending it because it feels there's a good feeling of really getting one done if it works right. For me, it's mostly up until that point, it's just work, you know, really sorting out the problems. You know, I like, I do like. Once the painting starts to look good, when you start to really feel the form and it really st the drawing is all there, that's a good feeling. You know, so maybe like three quarters into the painting, that's great. There's always a point where I hate the painting, <laughs> and then if I can get through that point, then I start to like it. You know, but it's always a very it's hard for me to deal with it because I get extremely emotional. You know, especially if somebody's watching me. Yeah. You know, I'm like, all right, here we go. I better make this work. Yeah. Well, we hear a lot of talking about uh, a good finishing, and actually, uh, what, what is a, a good finishing for you? Does a good finishing, or thinking about a good finishing, a destroyed personality or something? Oh, like you mean like a destroy? No, I think that, you know, for example, the again, the one I was doing yesterday, if I had more time, someone came over to me and says, oh, I love all the brush marks, and I actually don't like it. I think, mm -hmm. oh, I would want to have less marks. You know, for me, it's a little bit busy looking, yeah. but that's the way usually a three-hour painting, it's going to be a little bit more like that. But if I had a little more time, I'd smooth it out a little bit more. You know, I'd, I'm not afraid to try to overwork it. I think uh, that's actually better to really push as far as you can, because I think for me, that's when I've learned things. If you stop and think, oh, I think it's enough there you're not going to get better, you know? Yeah. Like, for me, it's always trying to make it better. Like, don't stop the pose if the model is still there. Keep going right to the last minute, you know? Um, yeah. So I'm not worried about that kind of, you know, pushing it a little far, so. And when did those press marks, those press croaks you were talking about, when did they stop being expressive and start being egocentric? <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Yeah, you want to, that's a, a good balance, you know, you don't want the painting to look like I'm trying to show off, here's the brush marks, there's a huge school of painting that's doing that now, which I hate. <laughs> I'm like, don't show me how smooth you are with your brush marks, so I really try not to do that. So I don't, I don't want the painting to feel like I think I'm really cool, here's my painting, you'll be impressed with it. I want it to look like I'm interested in the subject matter, 
that's bigger than me, the artist. That's why I don't even like signing my paintings. It bothers me when I see a name written. So now I'm signing everything on the back from now on just because I can't stand the word written on it. But um, I think that every technique, there's a good way and a bad way to do it. You know, you can do brush strokes in a good way, like Van Gogh, very brush strokey, but I never get the sense that he's got an ego. He's interested in the, what he's looking at. You know, you can feel it, how interested he is. I don't, you know, you'll, you can look at painters now and you can see the ones where it's like the portrait with the, it's fading away like illustrators kind of trick. You know, that stuff doesn't impress me at all because they don't seem interested in the world enough. They seem interested in impressing people. And that to me is, it's not interesting to me, you know, if it's an ego thing. You know, I want, uh, <clears throat> You know, that you can always get better, you know, so push as far as you can, you know. And the brush stroke is something that I work, I, I try not to make it look like I'm trying to show off. You know, I just like that fluid look, you know. You think of, the first person I think of is Velasquez. You know, there's a painting called The Weavers, you know, with the women in the foreground with the loom. And just looking at the way he moved the brush, you can see the brush marks, but he's not showing off so much. Maybe he is He is a little bit, but he's so good it doesn't matter maybe. You know, I think that's the other thing is that how can you ever show off when there's painters like that out there? So if you actually look at art history, there's no reason to get any ego about it. You know. And who do you get pieces of advice from? Painters, you yeah, mean? No, yeah, or any people around you. Yeah, I mean, I have my friends look at my work and they will just make comments, you know, and I always listen to people, you know. Usually the first thing someone says, you know, I always take that into account. Like like yesterday, someone says, oh, I love the brush marks. To me, I was like, okay, painting is too brush marky. <laughs> you know, that's what I thought. Even though they liked it, I think, okay. Um, you know, I have other friends who will just, some of them not even painters, that will just make a comment when I will always listen to that, you know, like... Because there's things I won't necessarily notice, you know, like, um, sometimes it's very frustrating too, though, you know, like I did a painting that I, I really liked, and I had it in a show, and someone made a comment, it really bothered me at the show, they were like, she looks like she's sad, and to me it didn't have that, the model in the painting, and I had never even thought that once when I was painting, I think it's because she didn't have a big smile on her face, you know, and I'm thinking, well, that's why it's a better painting. And about this idea of, uh tortured artist is it is it necessary to be tortured to be a good artist yes <laughs> <laughs> the better more tortured you are the better you'll be well i think you know what i always think about is there's a very it's one of my favorite quotes and i can't remember the whole quote but it's bertrand russell and he says that the the it goes to the politics again it's like the nice people are always full of doubt but the confident people always shout the loudest so i always think that I always loved like the underdogs, kind of like the people that are more worried about their stuff. You know, I, I think that I sympathize with those people more. I don't think it's not so much you have to be tortured, but I think that it, it if you really think about, I think you have a better chance of doing a good object of art if you are very thoughtful you know if you're only about the money you're probably not going to do anything good but if you're really thinking about like life and death of people that you love and important real things and just how am i going to get better and everything in your life that's it's it's going to make you a better artist you know but so you kind of have to accept that if you're that type of a person you know i mean i'm kind of like that i'm always worrying about <laughs> my paintings you know but i tried also you know, the last couple of years I've been thinking, you know, don't worry to the point where you don't want to paint. Because <clears throat> that used to happen to me where I would get so depressed that I, I would just feel like terrible. You know, maybe like my life is just worthless. You know, I can't do anything else. You know, because I do think like even now, like if I couldn't paint, would I still want to live? You know, would I still enjoy life if I didn't have any art? And I'm not sure if I would. That's the strange thing. You know, and that's not good. You know, you have mm -hmm. to be... You have to kind of look at yourself as a human being, too. And, and for me, that's difficult because I'm very one way. You know, my life is out of whack. Like, think, you know, you think about Van Gogh. You know, would anybody like his paintings if he didn't try to cut off his ear? You know, they might not. You know, like, they so much of, like, 
who certain artists are is is that kind of tortured artist at the same time they commercialize that part of it too they say oh look at this person he was so fascinating you know blah 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 they and, and they're all human beings you know like I'm sure, you know, Michelangelo had a few days when he just sat around and got drunk, too. I'm sure he didn't draw religiously every day. Maybe he did, though. I don't know. I'm sure. He... And would you have a beer with him? Or would you just Absolutely. rather stick with the Well, you know who's a, a great person to look at for everything is Rembrandt. He was like a tortured artist, but he loved to party and have a good time as well. So there's the, the famous painting of Rembrandt where he's... Uh, <laughs> has the huge glass of beer in his hand and his wife is looking worried, you know, like here's my drunk husband again, <laughs> you know? So here's the most disciplined painter, but he also loved to buy things. You know, he spent all this money. Then he went totally broke. Everyone died in his family. So every conceivable thing happened to him. And if you look at his self portraits, you can tell he was very, you know, introvert, like brooding, like always thinking, you know, he's not smiling at you. So if you, had to choose a, a beer mate for going and have a beer within the art world. Living be, or dead? Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, it'd have to be Caravaggio. Although <laughs> he might like bash me over the head with something too if I said the wrong thing, you know, because he was, you know, about him. He was very, he was probably one of those people that's really fun to be with. Then he has a few drinks and things get a little crazy. I think that's like, so he'd be a great one. Rembrandt would be wonderful. Um, gee, so many. Oh. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci would be wonderful. He was supposedly a real character, so he'd be fascinating. Um, and Michelangelo, just... not that much. Well, oh, him too. Oh, yeah. I, I think that Leonardo was more. Uh, I think I don't. It's hard to find out Michelangelo, the human being, because so many people that wrote about him idolized him. So they wrote about him like he was a god almost, and 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 you know where you never really know what he really was like as a person on a daily basis so it's it's they never promote his humanity it's always like he's the god of artists he's perfect you know whereas someone like leonardo was extremely eccentric so he would probably be the one you know because he's uh -huh. so he did everything he's a musician he supposedly was very handsome he liked to dress fancy clothes you know i mean he was like I mean, if he was here now, you might not be able to find him. He'd probably be off in the field, like, wandering, drawing some <laughs> tree somewhere, you know. So he was, I think, the most versatile artist I can think of, you know, for just, you know, doing different things. I, I think Caravaggio is an amazing, interesting That's man. <laughs> you know, he's an interesting man because of his personality. He's such a violent person that he could go into the studio and, you know, do an incredible painting that's very rare you know i think that you don't see artists l like that anymore you know just talked about about classical artists and w what about contemporary art do you think that contemporary art museums are kind of boring um no no not at all i i enjoy almost more going to the contemporary museum now because i've looked at the classical for so long it's almost nice to I get a little bit of excitement when I see some some new paintings, but for me, contemporary art is still like the 1950s. Even I, there's so much going on now that I don't know. I mean, I try to look at more than just figurative painting, but I'm still only scratching the surface. There's so many artists I know that are installation artists, you know, that just get a room and they fill it with like strange things. So I, I think, what do I what do I think about this? I don't really know. You know, once in a while I will see something that for some reason is very interesting but there is a there's a randomness to it you know since you can do anything now it's almost a little bit like feels almost like it's washed out a little bit you know so i do like i still like painting that's what i started with that's what i'm interested in so i will probably you know I've, of all the art shows i've gone to in my life probably 99 percent were painting shows you know so so I definitely am interested in contemporary art. I mean, I, I'm, I like that people can do whatever they want. Um, but I also, to be, you know, I'm not going to say I don't prefer painting because I do. That's what I do and I understand it, you know. So I like to see people, you know, doing something with their hands. Um, 
I like to look at that because there's less and less of that. You know, less things are being done with people's hands. You know, I'm reading about like artificial intelligence even now and they're making whatever, quantum computers, whatever it is, and it's like less and less is going to be done by hand. So if I see a show of paintings that's still a little bit of tradition involved, I, I love that, you know, even if it's a modern painter. Um, and there's a lot of really good contemporary figurative painters, too, that I love. So um, I guess the answer in short answer is no, I don't think modern <laughs> art is bad. <laughs> I think it's good. Uh, but there's just a lot of it, so you really have to know what you like. You have to kind of look through it all, and once in a while you're going to find something really good. So. Just for Anton, what do you think of Menorca this far? It's great. It's very beautiful. Um, the light is beautiful. The house is amazing. Uh, the food is good. Um, so uh, it's a really great, special place, you know. You will be welcome. Glad to be time. here. You will be welcome at a time. Oh, thank Holly. you. So let's test. Cheers. Thank so you. Cheers. We can do this. Yeah. <laughs> See you next time. Thank you.